This poem was written by Roy Bentley, and the title of it is Doc and Wyatt, and it goes like this. Part 1. John Henry Doc Holliday recalls his early years. My uncle James Franklin Johnson had the honor of casting one of 208 I votes in favor of secession. Whereupon Georgia followed South Carolina's lead out of the abolitionist union. I was twelve, a boy, when father moved mother and me south to Savannah, where Sherman ended his march to the sea. After the war, mother died of pulmonary tuberculosis. It was September, the live oak limbs slicked with rain. We buried her and moved to Valdosta. In Valdosta, Sophie Walton, a mulatto, my nanny, taught me to love card playing. I learned the importance of keeping track of the discard pile, which she named the Deadwood. I could forget one world by losing myself in another. However, I did see the faces of my fellow Southerners in the vague faces of the Kings and One-Eyed Jacks, like someone had shoved a gun barrel into the back of each head. What brought me to study dentistry? I was enrolled at the Pennsylvania College of Dental Surgery in Philadelphia, or rather, I'd been sent away after firing over the heads of some Negro swimmers at a white swimming hole on the Withlacoochee River. Mother's death, what I'd seen the northern bluebellies do to the south, I'd have to say all of it made me hard. I may have lacked sensibilities others claim to possess. Whatever the case, I applied myself became a dentist. I opened a practice in Atlanta where the Bells took note. Then I developed tuberculosis and started losing weight. My Uncle John ran the bronchioscope, the stethoscope. He made the diagnosis, said it wasn't a death sentence. The next year, Father decided I should go west. I left on a Houston and Texas Central train bound for Dallas. There I became part of the temperance organization for a short time. Great gain might have been mine and love. However, for all the usual reasons, how shall I put this? I chose the solace of saloons. Part two. Meeting in Deadwood, 1876. After my usual quart of whiskey, after the pharaoh and blackjack, and a throw at the dice tables at Tom Miller's The Bella Union, previously the Bella Union Variety Theater of Cheyenne, there were nights the coughing kept me awake until dawn, when I'd sleep the sleep of the dead like some whores do. I knew one who could sleep through gunplay, or a cowboy turning another cowboy's heart inside out with a bowie knife. One morning I got up, washed and dressed, and sauntered up the street in search of a steak. I passed him, Wyatt Earp, traveling in the opposite direction. I sidestepped a steaming pile of horse turds. He'd stopped. I stopped, too. We knew one another, most likely by reputation. No introductions. Just talk of November, odds of an early snowfall, nothing about how you had to watch all the time in Deadwood not to step in horse shit. Nothing of the sort you wish. Part 3, The OK Corral. That's what you're here for, isn't it? At trial, Wyatt said he fired first at Frank McClowry. Said he hit Frank in the stomach. I can't say. 
I was busy emptying both barrels of a shotgun into Frank's brother Tom, who, they said, died from buckshot wounds on his right side, all within a four-inch diameter. Frank was on the ground, gut shot, talking. He'd shot Morgan Earp in the shoulder. I thought I was shot, too, but the bullet had grazed my hip. Frank said, I've got you this time. And I said, something to the effect of, blaze away. You're a daisy if you have. I tossed the shotgun. I had my arms spread wide. Wyatt fired. Virgil fired, too. Virgil Earp was shot through the calf. I pulled a pistol and shot Frank. The belly wound, Wyatt's work, or one I added behind the ear, or both, would have killed him. Many times after, I cried out in the dark. I'd say, God and my trigger finger would pull on its own, as if God was one of the Clantons or McClowrys. Part 4. Wyatt Earp and Tombstone. Now when he goes out, it's as a U.S. Marshal, shadowed by yours truly. He walks the streets, farrier of the tried and trusted, alchemist, answering lead for lead. If he carries a pistol, it's holstered under a long black coat in the way that some men carry unadorned dying in Cochise County in 1882, like extra ammunition. If he remembers his brother, Virgil Earp, it's as if that brother were buried and not, instead, without the use of an arm, but alive and marshalling elsewhere. A believer in the power of that restorative miracle elixir called starting over. Another brother, Morgan, is dead from a 45 slug through the kidney, blood out in the card room of Bob Hatch's pool hall on Allen Street. Morgan's body is already at the train station, which is where we're headed. I cough again. You could probably say that a sort of pageantry of the hopeless fills the air. I wouldn't say that. But try lighting a cigar in a March wind in Arizona to the rude accompaniment of a tubercular friend coughing up a lung. That's the sound of loading a brother's coffin onto a train then getting the drop on a man who begs forgiveness between the rail cars, the gravel sound of that same man falling to his knees, clutching the shotgun before you unload both barrels, his raised hand and black heart flying out from him in a rush of color for which there never was a name. All Wyatt knows is that sometimes Someone will kill the good in us and wish it back. That it isn't there, waiting like a freight man porter, isn't our fault. Because what it takes to be this herb is to carry a sawed-off 12-gauge and call what happens next a consequence of something else. Forget mercy. Part 5. Why Wyatt Earp is buried in a Jewish cemetery. The old marshal died on January 13, 1929, a victim of chronic cystitis, a prostate problem. Casey Tiefertiller on the death of Wyatt Earp. I'd been dead for years when they pulled a sheet over Wyatt. They said he was a man of few words, meaning he wasn't one to brag about his lack of faith. We'd seen for ourselves, him and me, that even the faithless need a star of David or some sort of marker with dates and a name to signify the final resting place 
at those grandly human moments when the Almighty's existence is of little consequence. Even if Josephine Sadie Earp was a prodigious gambler, hard and sentimental, and always jovial, she's the one who buried the urn of his ashes in the Marcus family plot at the Hills of Eternity Cemetery in Colma, near San Francisco. According to her, Wyatt's last words were, suppose, suppose. Clearly, my friend came to value women who upend with the dumb gift of a kiss, considerations of an afterlife.